Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. Engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. This is your host, Fei Wu. On this podcast, you will meet a group of sung and unsung heroes who are willing to share their stories with you and what it means to them to live a happy and meaningful life. From Academy Award winner Christina Reed to Wall Street Journal best-selling author Claudia Azula Altucher, Hall of Fame martial artist Michael J. O'Malley, renowned jazz musician Ralph Peterson Jr., director of innovation Matt Lindley, Steinway artist George Coe, and many others. Every one of my guests brings unique perspectives that form an interplay of careers, explorations, personal philosophy, and being in the moment. Then my website, faceworld.com, has a page dedicated to every guest where you can find show notes, links, tactics, tools, ideas you can use. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my guest today. His name is Tom Seaborn. Tom is a professor, author, fitness coach, martial artist, cyclist. I am honored to share this two-part conversation with Tom Seaborn. Tom has a PhD in exercise science. He was a member of the U.S. Taekwondo team and the national and international AAU Taekwondo champion. Tom was introduced to me by my Taekwondo instructor, Michael O'Malley, who appeared on an earlier episode of the Face World podcast. In addition to Taekwondo, Tom is an ESPN Professional Karate Association Full Contact Karate winner. If there are avid cyclists who are listening to this podcast, it's worth mentioning that Tom was the winner of Ram Open West and ranked top 10 in the 1990 Race Across America. Tom is also the national 12-hour record holder of 229 miles. Uh, Tom has a Guinness World Record for indoor cycling in 2009 for riding 185 hours straight. So that was a very long-winded introduction. But besides competition, Tom appeared on a number of televisions and video series such as the QVC Fitness Expert. He also co-hosted a number one rated infomercial, Six Second Abs, Fox Morning Show, Good Morning Texas, Stay Fit, ABC, Insight Fitness, CBS, National, and many more. Tom has authored over 200 articles and 16 books. You can find them on Amazon or simply go to my website where I reference these books in the podcast. What strikes me the most, however, is not the endless list of Tom's accomplishment as an athlete, as an educator, but rather is his humbleness, openness, and his willingness to flex, listen, and learn. In part one, we talked about fitness. For example, feeling versus looking good. And how does Tom inspire people to think and rethink this question in general? Fitness versus performance. What is Tom's point of view on training for race across America. And in part two, which is the following episode, we'll be focusing on personal life, goals, and, and even challenges as a fitness educator today. I offer Tom some of my own advice on uh, how an athlete like himself could potentially take advantage of social media. But beyond Facebook and Twitter, uh, for example, places or channels such as Quora or Ubersense, and how to influence people at a national and international level without extensive travel. And that was an important factor for Tom. But you know what? There is no better era than the one we're in today to influence, educate, and establish authentic connections right from our homes. I am super excited to be sharing this episode with you all. However, I do want to apologize in advance for the sound quality. Tom lives in Texas and uh, was very busy at the time, so we quickly jump on the call. So it was not recorded via Skype, but a regular phone call. If you have any questions, things that you don't catch in this audio, please head over to my website, faceworld.com, and you'll be able to see Tom's episode right on the homepage. So thank you in advance for staying with Phase World Podcast. And if you have any feedback, comments, please let me know. Please welcome Tom Seaborn. Uh, so one of the 
questions I always、uh, wondered about. As you know, I'm into martial art, and I had a lot of insecurities about my look, my body. I mean, like most other women out there, this is not news. And you know, what is your thoughts on fitness in terms of for men, it's muscle and fitness. For women, it's the bikini look versus actual health. You know the looking good versus the feeling good. Where do you draw that line, and how do you aspire people to really think about this question, or possibly rethink this question? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. And, and in fact, there, there's an old saying, and I didn't come up with it, but I, I like to use it.、Uh, Kenneth Cooper, the fellow who invented the word aerobics, and his、uh, facility is just a couple hours away in Dallas. He came up. Phrase: It's better to be fat and fit than skinny and sedentary,、mm -hmm. and that really says it all. Where you don't know what's going on inside someone's body. You know, someone may look like a fantastic figure model or a professional bodybuilder, but if they can't walk up a flight of stairs, or if, if she, you know, being real skinny is is what we call Um, you know, you know. Have you ever touched somebody? Think about your martial arts class,、mm -hmm. where you, you touch maybe、uh, a female student, and she feels skinny fat. Where, you know, if you were to look at her in clothes, then you think, oh, she she's in good shape. But、mm -hmm. then you touch her arm, and it's like soft. There's no muscle there.、Mm -hmm. And and there are a lot of people walking around like that, where they look good, but you realize, you know, even even just the The outward touch, you realize, wow!、Well, number one, they have no muscle, and then think of that from a cardiovascular perspective. Like, wow, you don't know at all from just looking at someone what what's going on inside the body. So, yeah,、uh, I, I love the saying of、uh, Kenneth Cooper, and I think we should all kind of remember that it's not all about cosmetics.、Mm -hmm. One answer. It's、uh, I think it's my favorite answer. I was going to jump in and say, you know what? I don't think I look that great, but I'm solid. <laughs> I'm the opposite of that case. So it's、uh, no. This is amazing. And I have another question related to a day in the life of Tom. You had mentioned that you get up at four o'clock, and I have to say, I don't even know there there is a four o'clock.、Um, I'm a sleeping beauty. So and.、Um, <laughs> So you had mentioned that you work out for one hour, four,、uh, five, five to six, or four thirty to five thirty. You know, one hour is a lot for some people, but it isn't a lot for some of these、um, workout maniacs out there. So, you know, I was wondering: is is one hour all you do seven days a week, or do you take some time off? What, what is your routine like? You know.、Um... So this one hour is seven days a week, and and some people call that overtraining. But you 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 hit the nail on the head. For some people, one hour is nothing.、Mm -hmm. And when when I used to train for these long distance cycling events, like the race across America, and then when we did a Guinness World Record, oh no no, Dan, I was training probably. Remember how Michael O'Malley said he trained like fifteen sixteen hours a day? Yeah. I was do I was doing that every day seven days a week, and I know this sounds crazy, but imagine being on a bike for twenty two and a half hours a day、mm -hmm. for seven days. So to train for that, you have to do at least that,、mm -hmm. be able to perform at that level during the actual event, and then and then the race across America. It's basically you start with your back wheel in the Pacific Ocean, finish. Your front wheel in the Atlantic, and the first one that gets their win. So you're only sleeping an hour 
hour and a half a night during that race, and it takes you nine to ten days to get across the country. And so with that type of a race, then the training involved is just nonstop. And, and basically all of us, what we call RAM, RAM racers, Race Across America, that's the acronym, and all of us are overtrained, but we have to be in order to perform. So here, here's, here's my take. Performance is different than fitness. To, to perform well in the Race Across America or to set a Guinness World Record, it's really not good for your body. It's, it's actually taking away. I mean, after that Race Across America, I, I mean, I wasn't normal for two weeks. <laughs> my, my heart rate was high. Metabolism was through the roof. And same after the Guinness World Record. I, you know, I had so, such bad sleep deprivation that, it, you know, you call yourself sleeping beauty. That's where, that's where I was for two weeks after just <laughs> to get back to normal. So there's training for fitness and there's training for performance. And I, I run into this all the time where students of mine, they tell me their routine. And they may only be training an hour a day, but they're trying to gain muscle. This is guys in particular. But what they'll do is they'll overtrain the same muscle group, especially for guys, chest, and biceps. And what they don't realize, and this is what I alluded to earlier, if you take a day off or two days off, that's, that's recovery, and that creates what's called super compensation so that you're actually going to build muscle. So for a lot of folks, especially overzealous Americans, to this high level of Medic achievement very quickly. They're doing more harm than good by overtraining. Mm, very interesting. And speaking of which, how do you manage training your own muscle groups, and how does that um, break down seven days a week? Oh, you're you're asking a great question. I, everybody's different, and mm-hmm. everybody's physique is different, and everybody responds to training differently. And for some reason, uh, and I, I I haven't, you know, I should. You know how I, I, I was like a trainer to trainers when I was traveling. You know, first I would train personal trainer. Well, I don't have a personal trainer, so you know I, I kind of wish I did. But I pretty much, to avoid overtraining a certain muscle group, I train pretty much one muscle group a day, mm-hmm. so that I'm still hitting each muscle group about twice a week, and. You know, as, I, as I'm getting older, you know, I, supposedly I should slow down. Everybody says, you know, you, you read all the literature, oh, you need more recovery as you age. Well, I don't know if personally, if I do, I'm not sure. I haven't noticed it. Mm. I feel like I can retain more muscle by doing the routine I'm doing mm-hmm. than if I did take more days off. So for me, uh, I'm better off doing uh, what we call a split routine so that, for example, it might be, um, okay, I'll give you exactly how it works. There's only one day a week I do two muscle groups, and that would be chest and back uh, on the first day, then the second day, shoulders, and then the third day, is arms, meaning biceps and triceps, and then uh, fourth day is leg. And I just repeat that cyclically and never miss a day. Mm-hmm. And I know there are experts out there listening and saying, this guy's crazy, he's overtraining. Well, I'm not. For me, mm-hmm. I have, you know, my joints are fine, um, I, I'm staying strong, I feel good. And I don't know about you, but I love to wake up and the first thing I do is train. That's, that's the very first thing I do. Mm-hmm. And it wakes me up. So, admittedly, I guess I'm kind of like, I feel like I'm doing an, an encounter group as I'm talking right now. I'm thinking like I'm talking to uh, my therapist, and I'll say this. <laughs> it makes me feel good, and that's my number one reason for doing it. Mm-hmm. The cosmetic is there a little bit, because that's my profession. I have to look the part, so I, so I do it for that. But the third and most important thing, if I don't do it, if I, if I don't do this hour of physical activity in the morning, and I, my joints feel bad. I feel like, sometimes I feel like I'm catching a cold. So I feel 
almost like, I don't want to say that I'm addicted to this exercise program, but if I miss it, I don't feel like, I, I feel wonderful when I do it. And to be honest, I haven't missed a day. Even, even when I have a maze, you know, like some horrible scheduling conflict, I find a way to do something. Maybe I, I don't get the full hour, but just doing something gives me that beneficial feeling that I, I did what I needed to do for the day. Fitness can be your passion. You know, it's, it's not just, it's certainly a routine, um, clearly. But I could relate to that because in my line of work, and, you know, my routine is mine, and some people may disagree, and I don't have a lot of coworkers follow exactly what I do, even though we're all working in advertising, we could be in similar in age. It's really about program, if you're smart enough to tailor a program specific to yourself. And I find it to be, I feel amazing when I work out for that one hour during lunch break. And of course, I have to eat afterward. But, but somehow, whether yoga or aerobic exercise really depends on my mood. I like variety, for instance. But after I work out, I take a shower, my mind is so sharp in the afternoon and remains sharp. I, I, I resolve problems much easier and I enjoy going to meetings as a result. And super efficient. And I want to give you another example of um, uh, a professor I admire dearly, Ethan Boker. He was the inspiration when I went to his son's wedding in Florida. And I remember putting my toe in the in the swimming pool and thought to myself, oh, a little too cold for me. I'm just going to sit out. And Ethan was already in his late 60s at the time. And he hopped right in and was sw- swimming freestyle butterfly and in me, oh man, immediately I felt embarrassed and then got a private uh, swimming instructor and I, I'm now considered a pretty good swimmer. But, you know, and Ethan also, just like you said, every morning, 4.30, 5 o'clock before he goes teaching, he not just walk his dog, he runs with the dogs, two dogs, for about three to four miles. And he's been doing that for, I'm going to misquote him, it's got to be nearly 50 years at this point. He hasn't skipped a day. And he said exactly what you said is he really needs, it's not, he's not doing the dogs a favor. They're doing him a favor. <laughs> you know? right. So, and this is you know, really uh, fascinating. You said, you said some things there, and, I, and I, my memory is too short, and I, that's why I, I hate to interrupt, but, you know, if, if everybody had an inspiration, and, and I, I, I remember now, as, as you were just talking, I had an inspiration where I went to, I don't even remember what it was. It was, it was, it was a karate demonstration or a taekwondo demonstration for sure. But I don't remember the context. I don't remember why I was there, but I was young. Maybe I was 15 or something. And all I remember, and who knows, maybe Michael O'Malley will, will have some uh, insight into the demonstration that I saw. Mm-hmm. I remember a 60-year-old Korean man jump up, break, <laughs> two, two boards simultaneously, and then land in a something similar to a Chinese split. And I remember <laughs> thinking to myself, oh my God, when I'm 60, you know how people people will say, well, when I'm 90, I want to look like that person. Who, yeah. And I thought to myself, when I'm 60, I want to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Well, I can't do that. I mean, I never could do that. <laughs> but, gosh, but what an inspiration. And I, I think everybody needs an inspiration. Yeah. You know, you know, thinking thinking about the guy, you know, doing his laps. And, uh, you know, we all isn't it funny how we all have different inspiration. We we look at someone, and and then you're probably an inspiration for people too, and you don't even know it. You know, with what you've done as a third degree black belt, and mm-hmm. with, with your work, and uh, now your podcast. So you don't you don't even know that people are looking up to you, and I, and I think all of us, you know, one of my colleagues at lunch the other day said, he said your life is you could do a reality show, just some of the weird stuff. But then I said to him, he's a computer uh, teacher. I said, well, you too, but people don't look at their own lives mm-hmm. and, and realize of, of all of the craziness and the excitement, you know that. Because they're just living their day to day, and they don't realize how cool it really is. But so I think a lot of us, you know, and you made me realize in this conversation, yeah, that we should we should be a little 
more excited about what we're doing and take what we're doing, uh, it, it may be more than fixed value. There, there may be things going on there where you're helping other people and don't even know it. I couldn't agree more. And I, not to say that I feel obligated or always wanted to be an inspiration, you know, I, I was at an all-day workshop today, and one of the questions is, what are some of the things that billionaires know and other regular people don't? And the answer to that is everybody, turns out, is a billionaire. You just don't know it. In a corporate setting, you could be blocked by a certain number of constraints. But I argue that in our lives, we're blocked by our own constraints, spiritual constraints. Um, we feel very vulnerable. But think about when you flip that around is power of vulnerability. And that is really amazing. There are a number of people out there by sharing their fears. So many people could relate to their fears and together you become more powerful. And, wow. you know, and in so many ways that we feel that we are alone, you know, and only we yeah. carry the fears. But one of the things that really inspired me to conduct this podcast, I must give credit to Mr. O'Malley by watching him inspiring young people, young souls in Peabody. And I would highly encourage that you pay a visit if, if all possible, that it, it break it, it makes me feel cheerful, it makes my all my neurons connected and makes me really look much above and beyond my own life and my own fears. And I remember going to watch this test and that at that point the school had only been around for about a year. And I saw a group of children from the demonstration team perform. And the little boys and girls were throwing, were punching so hard that they're throwing, like, almost they're losing balance in their body. Like, their bodies are popping. And, and I was just watching. And I just remember myself tearing up. And it was inappropriate for me to cry or feel that level of emotions. It was a test. But I just... I, all of a sudden, I forgot all my own problems. And as a result, that's a place where I want to be. But I wanted to tell you this funny story was, you know this very well, and this has been the favorite story told on my podcast. So I'm sure people won't mind hearing it again. We're hearing it for the first time. Whenever we go to a test, we have, we <laughs> feel like I'm very much part of the school. And Mr. O'Malley's school is there are children as young as three or four years old. And I forget that sometimes. And I talk to them, they're like, huh? And they're picking their nose and all that stuff. So, um, you know, I deal with mostly 25, 30 year olds at work. So, and at the end of the test, I saw these little kids, the five, four or five year old picking up chairs bigger than they are. And they're, re they're organizing, they're asking Mr. Melly where the vacuum cleaner is. And they're getting all these like tissue paper, trying to clean everything. And one of the kid's parents said to, said to him that, Hey, Bob, how come you never clean at home? Your, your bedroom is a mess, you know? And there, and then the little kid, Bob, look at his dad. is like, Dad, this is a place of great importance, you know? And his dad is like, what about our home? The kid is like, oh, that doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything at all. It's just home, you know? And <laughs> I just, every time I think about that example, along with many others, um, I, I created this little yearbook. It's called um, O'Malley Taekwondo Moments. And I put some markers there and you get these teenagers writing these super heartfelt comments and I keep reading them over and over again. And there are little kids who don't know how to write yet, such as the four or five year olds are write down Mr. O'Malley and Mr. Flau are ASOM, A-S-O-M. And, <laughs> and then all the other little kids trying to copy the word. So you see ASOM all the way across, like as you flip through the pages and just so cute i mean so many stories um but you know i just thank you for sharing your stories with me and i know that i got us off of a, a different tangent here a little bit so i'm gonna loop ourselves back in uh post production is what are i mean this goes on forever but i am again just super impressed by what you've done with your own body and and this is since i've uh turned 30 you know, I've been warned many times, I've been active my whole life, but I, I gotta say that the pounds do creep up, and almost, and I'm a foodie, I love food and all kinds of world cuisines out there, and um, I've been very careful, so just out of curiosity, you know, 
I can still ask the question regardless of whether uh, you are a nutritionist or um, a dietitian. Is there any dietary preference or any supplements that you you take that type of stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, number one, uh, with your pictures on Facebook, you, you're, you're funny because no, women, I think, are very hard on themselves. You know, like, oh, I'm getting fat or <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and you're right. I'm not a nutritionist, but um, fortunately or unfortunately, be, being where I live. I have to be a jack of all trades, and, and even when I was doing the traveling and training trainers, uh, I still did some programs on nutrition, just because there's there's such a dearth of information. I mean, there's and there's so many scams out there, and people trying to make a buck, and so basically, I'm going to just be quoting the research, and, and, and in a nutshell, it, it is that you know we should eat close to the ground, meaning vegetables and some fruits. Know, drink lots of water, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't know if you're a vegetarian or not, but um, getting some form of protein is, is so important, and mm-hmm. trying to separate your meals throughout the day instead of eating just one meal. Mm-hmm. I know, you know, it, go, thinking through the years and, and trying to help people with their eating pattern, that's the most difficult thing to change in anybody. I mean, I can, I can get them workout programs, no problem, but mm-hmm. changing their eating, it's so dear to them. It's part of their existence. You know, their family, they, they eat a certain way. And, gosh, I, I remember making so many mistakes growing up, thinking, oh, let's let's do the low-fat thing. And what a mistake <laughs> that was, because yeah. when, when we did the low-fat during that era, and you, I don't know, you were pretty young during that era, but People were getting fatter and fatter eating low fat because they were piling on the carbs. And, and so then true. we finally realized, and even after, uh, I remember writing articles on nutrition and, and having knock down, drag out fights with people from Atkins who were calling and emailing me saying that, uh, you know, I, I would make a comment in an article, and I, I remember this like yesterday, I would say, quote, that carbs are your most efficient fuel source for your brain and your muscles. Mm -hmm. And it's not untrue. That's not an untrue statement. But we are all biologically different, and many of us don't react well to carbohydrates, especially the starchy carbs like breads, pasta, box cereals. And we, we kind of, in America, we want one thing, like, okay, don't eat carbs or don't eat fat, well, it doesn't work that way. We, we need a balance of macronutrients, of you know, good fats, good carbs, mm-hmm. and good proteins. So with that said, if, if you were to ask me, you know, how should I eat? And, and I, I can't generalize it because some people have problems with, with wheat and with mm-hmm. certain carbs, but for other people, they don't. And so I will say this. person were to look at their eating pattern and if they're finding that the starchy carbs, like the ones I mentioned, bread, pasta, cereal, and all that, if they tend to cause you to gain weight and make you feel sluggish and maybe have other issues, then then go to the other types of carbs, like all of the different vegetables. And, mm-hmm. You know, raised in an Asian culture that you were in, uh, my wife, she's from El Salvador, and so lots and lots of vegetables. If you can't go wrong. You cannot go wrong with vegetables. Mm-hmm. And then when I said some fruits, it's just that some fruits have more sugars than others. But if you stay with the berries, then you'll you'll be fine with any any type of the berries. And you know I, I don't, you know I have uh, I have children who are vegetarians. I, I would never be a bit myself. I, I could not. I can't either. <laughs> yeah. and, and, it, and, I, and I don't want to sound mean, but a lot of the vegetarians that I see, they don't seem healthy. <laughs> they mm-hmm. don't seem strong. And, and there's really no research to, to prove that vegetarians live any longer than omnivores. So mm-hmm. um, with that said, we've got to get lean protein into our systems. Your, your first question opened up I, I thought we were, you were going to go in a different direction. I thought you were going to talk about metabolism. 
metabolism. Mm. And a lot of people feel like they get fatter as they get older, just it's going to happen with age. But it's not true. Yes. Um, there are so many <laughs> cases, and you probably know people too, that you, you may have to adjust your diet, uh, you may have to adjust your workout program, but no, you do not do not have to lose your metabolism as you get older. On, on one of my YouTube uh, little segments, I have a YouTube channel, and that was one of the biggest questions people would ask me during class, during my classes, you know, what is metabolism? So I, I just cut it down to about two minutes, what, what metabolism it is, I mean, what it is, and, and how to really take control. And in a nutshell, the thing to do to keep your metabolism revved is make sure that you're doing some sort of resistance training in your workout program so that you maintain your muscle. Uh, and, if, and if you were able to watch the video, it, it goes into detail about muscle is the only, is, and I don't want to say the only because I hate to use the word absolutes, but mm -hmm. it's, it's the most important thing we can do as, uh, you know, to have control of our metabolism maintain whatever muscle we have. So regarding diet, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're feeding our muscle but starving the fat. So uh, for most people, and I'll say most because this is, uh, gosh, I'm just looking at the research, is that the starchy carbs seem to be the culprit for most people. And what's scary is in America, the government subsidizes the starchy carbs in regarding, you know, let's say like wheat, corn, and soy. And, and that's, that's what, you know, look, look what the government actually pays farmers for these products instead of the broccoli, the cauliflower, you know, the, the vegetables that would be much better for us regarding nutrient density. So I, I know that was kind of long-winded, but I would say to cut it down into its basic form, eat close to the ground, vegetables, some fruits, drink lots of water, uh, eating protein uh, through the day, and mm -hmm. uh, essential fats as well. Lovely. And I'm, you know, this is, this can be difficult for certain people, but, you know, I can speak to that. And I certainly try to eat more regularly throughout the day and there is no excuse you know there are we can certainly have a separate podcast episode i would love to do a sequel for for this is some of the things you could prepare for while you're at work and you know set for me as a project manager i set timers on my calendar so that i remind myself to eat every three to four hours especially on days when i have personal training because i really suffered from not eating an hour or two before training uh, you you probably like this, and I very I feel like very recently, but it's probably been five to six months that I said to myself that I really want a personal trainer, and I was very lucky to find one that I like very much. Um, he might be on the podcast at some point. I don't know, maybe he's not ready just yet, but he is my age, and I once worked out with somebody who was 19, 20 years old, and, and he was a great guy but he didn't quite get what my body is going through because he was so much younger you know and with with this guy he's my current personal trainer just about a couple of years older than I am he's like I'm gonna tell you what's coming up and he really he has sympathy and empathy for <laughs> what I'm dealing with and I have to say that I benefit so much and some of the some of the quote-unquote weight gain I think well their actual weight gain are from um from my muscles and I feel stronger than ever before and I you know and, and a lot of the things I learn are really counterintuitive you know instead of getting my tailbone out and I kind of stick my stomach out I never thought about to maintain a a straight spine um you know just how important our postures are and as a result of personal training I keep thinking about it every day every doesn't matter where I am you know I remind myself so I I love where you're going with this um, a quick question on supplements, and that's something you haven't said, but are there any basic vitamins or supplements that you do take on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. The reason, uh, and, and here's my point, supplements are just that. They're, they're, 
They're there to supplement your eating program, but the eating program is everything. Mm -hmm. As you were saying, eating, you know, throughout the day to fuel your workout. But a lot of people will take supplements in thinking that it's some kind of a magic pill, again, for their, whether it's increasing metabolism or weight loss or energy or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, in my opinion, and again, I'm not a registered dietitian, so this is just an opinion. Uh, I personally do take uh, free fatty acids, and I, I've, I've looked at the research on it. I can't see any harm with it, you know, the omega-3 free fatty acids. Yes. Uh, and I do that for a variety. You know, I'm thinking about cardiovascular. I'm thinking about, well, I, I haven't seen any detrimental effects of taking them. And the benefits seem to be everywhere. I mean, you know, meaning your skin, your hair, your, I mean, uh, gosh, just pretty much all of our life functions. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I see nothing wrong with taking vitamin C and some of the other antioxidants. You hear pros and cons. You hear if you take too many antioxidants, you're, you're actually opening yourself up to uh, different forms of cancer. I don't know if the research is really strong there. So mm -hmm. I, there, there's so much, um, so much equivocal research on supplements. You know, it goes both ways. Uh, one supplement I, I'll, I'll have to make a make a little point of, and that is creatine, mm -hmm. where People have been afraid to take creatine because they say you harm your kidney. You could, uh, let's see what else. There's, I don't know. The media really hyped it up to kill you, that kind of thing. But you know, what I what I tell people is to do your own research. And uh, a supplement like creatine, which is actually found in food, can can be really helpful. Women are afraid of it. They, they think it's going to bloat them and make their muscles look <laughs> square and bulky. But, um, and I'm not suggesting people take this product, but if you look at the research, the research shows that the, there are not any of these negative side effects that, that people think. And again, I'm not promoting it, but I'm just saying that's one popular supplement that some people are afraid of. That, I haven't seen any research seen it saying that there's anything wrong with it. I think these are these supplements, all of them you mentioned, are are nothing really surprising and I'm very glad you mentioned them because I other than creatine, I take all the all of the above. And I've I'm also just like you have done a lot of research on my own and I talk to my friends who are um, you know, maybe not as experts in the field, but who are very intelligent and um, think it through. So it's so funny when you're mentioning them. I, I was like, oh, there's a glass of water. Maybe I should take some right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's a, a friend of mine who, uh, he, he made the comment, and I, I like this. I think it's pretty much true. And that is uh, the most important part of taking your supplement is the glass of water that you're drinking with the supplement. You know, mm -hmm. that's uh, water is so important, and I agree with that. But especially here in Texas, we're chronically dehydrated. And, uh, you know, now some people go over the opposite extreme, and you may have heard of the term hyponatremia. You can drink too much water, and mm -hmm. you can cause some issues, but but most of us don't. Most of us don't. So uh, that, that's first and foremost. I, I would say, if, if a person were worried about supplementation, just make sure they're hydrated first. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the other, and, and, and you know, you'll hear medical doctors will say, no, don't take supplements, just eat a balanced diet. But who, who eats a balanced diet? That's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. And as you were saying, with your, with your schedule, like, you know, you have meetings, you're, you're, you have a personal training session. But, mm -hmm. and what I'll tell students, and this is nothing new, and it, it's certainly not revolutionary, but, Prepare everything that you're going to eat the day before so that you know what you're going to have the next day. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to have to go scrounging and foraging for food when you'll have it on hand. Mm -hmm. And that may mean just having it in a plastic container or you know, maybe using a meal replacement shake if, if you absolutely have no access to real food. 
Mm-hmm. That, that's the biggest problem I see, is that people make bad choices because they're starving because they missed two out of the three meals that they were trying to eat through the day. It's so true. When it comes to when a uh, when it becomes starvation, it's an urgency, and you are going to just grab whatever it's in front of you. And for many of us who work in an office, that's leftover pizza. There's our potato chips floating around. I mean, at that point, I I see people start eating all kinds of stuff that they wouldn't <laughs> otherwise eat. So, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy that when you're hung, when you're when you're at that point where you no longer can make a rational choice. We're, we're always going to choose the more calorically dense foods, like the uh, high, high fat or high sugar. Mm-hmm. And, and those are the, the type. Well, okay, uh, uh, we have a thing, you know, you just made me remember something. This morning, we presented our fittest of the month. We have a fittest of the month contest at our college. And, you know, so every, every month we choose someone who's doing something a little bit extraordinary for their fitness. Uh, whether it's a certain exercise program or quitting smoking or something like that. And the guy that won for this month, he quit smoking. But as you know, when people quit smoking, they gain weight. It's it's just almost Mm -hmm. a natural thing that's going to happen. So, you know, we talk about that. And, well, when I I delved into his diet, you know, he, he was talking about, gosh, I don't know why I'm gaining weight, you know, I'm, I'm not eating the starchy carbs and blah, blah, blah. He's doing everything right. But then when I said, as we were finishing the conversation, because I just assumed that he knew this, I said, well, are you drinking soft drinks? And he said, yes, you know, like, no big deal. Mm -hmm. And he's drinking, like, the equivalent of a 16-ounce sugar soft drink every single day. Mm -hmm. And he didn't think that. He thought that was innocuous. He thought, oh, that's not doing it. No problem. <laughs> but yes, it is. I mean, that's, that's hundreds of calories a day of, of non-essential calories. And that's usually the first thing I focus on is in someone's eating plan. I'll say, do you drink sugar drinks, whether it's a lot of juice or soda? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it just so happened, I thought, I just assumed that he knew that already. But, gosh, sometimes we sabotage our programs. We don't even know we're doing it. Like, this is true. like you said, you know, with the chips or the pizza, or in, in his case, the soft drinks. Yeah, well, that's absolutely great observation. And sometimes it's so easy. I mean, it's not easy, but compared to everything else you have to do, sometimes I recommend that to my own friends. Just cut out the soft drinks and, and then maybe with the snacks, cookies, and one thing at a time. And, and, and your body really really adapt to the changes slowly, gradually, and become sustainable changes. Um, yeah. So... I agree. I, I, like, I like what you said, that you don't, you don't want to do too much too soon with some people. Now, mm-hmm. now, there's other, you know, this is why, you know, you know, I said earlier, I don't believe in absolutes. There are, most people I agree with exactly what you said. You change a little bit at a time, or one thing at a time. But, and then there's the other extreme of some people want it so bad that they're willing to do a huge lifestyle change all at once. Mm-hmm. But the word you used is sustainable. You have to make sure. Well, mm-hmm. here, here's another example. Uh, the, the lady in charge of our nursing program started this program, and I, and I was completely against it at first. It's, it's called um, Lighten Up East Texas. And it's a weight loss contest. And I could bet you have them up there where if you lose 5% of your body weight mm-hmm. in a certain period of time, you can win a car. <laughs> and I hate contests because whenever money or, in this case, you win a car is involved, then people will do anything to win mm-hmm. and, you know, involve in cheating. So how can you cheat on a weight loss? Well, it's, and, and the way the, the thing is measured is scale weight. Well, the scale doesn't know the difference between losing water, muscle, or fat. Mm -hmm. So a person can easily lose 5% of their body weight by just, you know, losing muscle, Mm -hmm. by by going on a very low-calorie diet. Dehydration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or dehydration, right. And so what? So they win a car, but then they gain all the weight back. Well, you know, maybe for some people they say, heck yeah, I'll I'll win that car and not worry about my weight. But But in this case, have hundreds and probably thousands of people in East Texas who are doing anything that they can to lose the weight. But as we were just talking,
talking about sustainable, keeping that weight off. Anybody can lose the weight. But having a manageable, a program that you can stay with for the rest of your life. In one of my books, I wrote the statement that any diet program that you can't do for the rest of your life is not worth doing for one day. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing magic about that. It's just that you've got to do something that you can stay with. And if you're doing some fad program that only lasts for a month and then you gain the weight back, then you, you shouldn't have done it at all. It was, wasn't worth your time. Yeah, great point. Completely agree. And there's so many people who, who start and quit, not only when it comes to diets, fitness, and many other you know, things that they could benefit significantly in their lives. And um, so that's part of oh, that human behavior. Especially exercise. I mean, you know, you've probably seen the research that 50% of the people quit an exercise program a month after they start. Mm-hmm. And what we see, the people who do exercise, you know, we see somebody running and then we see another person. Well, that same person is running and lifting weights. So 15% of the population is doing some sort of workout. 85% are doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the the key is to find something that they love. And that you said that earlier, you know, making martial arts, whatever you decide, if it's a passion, then you'll look forward to doing it. And even if it's just going for a walk, and like you said earlier about the dog, walking his dog, well, that, you know, Research shows again that if you have a pet, there's a better chance that you're going to be in good shape than someone who doesn't have a pet just because they have to walk the dog. Yeah. But yeah, we, we have to find ways to get people moving because it's crazy that, you know, it, it, what, what amazes me is you understand how exercise makes you feel. Mm-hmm. But more than half the population doesn't realize It'll make them feel better if they move, and they just have to move. And I think they make each other feel better. I, you know, I know this from working, and I'm fortunate enough to be working for a number of companies where fitness and health are the primary goals of their beings. And I, you know, we go work out together. It's very natural. But I've also worked in software companies where people don't don't move at all, and they're proud of it. They're proud of being glued to their desks, they eat at their desk, they don't move around. I mean, you know, I feel like it's funny when I use the term between you and me because this is clearly all public. So between you and me and the world, you know, I buy these um, wristbands and I don't have Fitbit. I have a, uh, another, oh, it's, it's called Jawbone. And I have one of the features, and I know that sometimes when you drive, right, and these fit, Fitbit start picking up, oh, you've been walking all these mileage. It's like, no, I'm driving and actually not moving. Uh, I just hit a pothole or something. But um, so one feature I love is I can set a timer every 20 to 30 minutes. If, you, if I don't get up, it start buzzing me. It start reminding me to move. And I love that feature. And it's so funny talking to you. I'm going to readjust to start eating my vitamins again because I purchased all of them and I forgot to eat any of them. Um, and then my Fitbit that I have in, uh, or Jawbones, I haven't charged for a long time. This is so cool. And I can't, it's so funny. Like we were, we were strangers to each other and we talked for nearly two hours. And this is like maybe the, the longest interview, but I love it. I'm going to break it down into two parts. We've been talking a long time, and both of us, our energy levels are waning a little bit. I think we both need a snack after we're done with this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's so funny. We were just telling all the uh, audience to eat every few hours, and our interviews are like four hours. <laughs> you start, exactly. <laughs> you start eating, like, you start hearing the sound. What's that? Like, are they eating potato chips while telling us what to eat? Um, <laughs> so three more questions we can, we can go through, but I think they're important is what do you do when you hit a physical or mental roadblock? You can answer one word or both, but you seem to be the person who really not, a, not just persevere, but uh, kind of find a venue, a gateway all the way through. So what do you do when you hit a roadblock? Wow. And you know, you, you're, you asked the right person. <laughs> no, no, because, because how many roadblocks have you had? And, and me, I'm, oh my gosh, 
and, and you know, people will say to me something like, um, oh, you've done all this, and I, and I tell them, oh my gosh, you should see how many things I've failed at and, and how many roadblocks have happened. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, the core curriculum is disappearing. So, you know, PE no longer is required. So that's a huge roadblock for me. That, that means that my life is going to change in one way or the other, you know. Mm-hmm. So what I immediately do, in, you know, as you ask that question, I, it just, my, my brain just, fired and it, and it what, what, what immediately happens when I perceive a roadblock is I don't fight against it. I don't say, oh no, PE is no longer in the core curriculum. I'm going to quit. I'm going to cry. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give up. But instead, there's always an alternative. There's always something else. So what, what happens, and I don't know if this happens with everybody, but well, I'll give you another example regarding martial arts. Um, you know, I loved AAU Tech. Back then it was called Amateur Athletic Union. You know, and I loved it. I mean, it was my life. And, you know, that was when Michael O'Malley and I were on the same U.S. team. Everything was going wonderful. And then I got a, I got a phone call on a Saturday saying, would you like to fight in a full contact ESPN fight mm-hmm. next Saturday? And I, and I had no idea of the repercussions. And I said, sure. So I, I drove to Oklahoma City, and I fought on ESPN. And then I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't think anything bad was going to happen. But then the, the nationals, uh, national AAU Taekwondo Championships were being held in Michigan. I think it was two months from then. So I flew up to Michigan, and I'm, I'm literally getting ready for my fight. I mean, I'm, I'm warming up. And over the loudspeaker, they didn't even tell me in person, but over the loudspeaker, you know, I heard this, uh, Mr. Seaborn will not be competing today because he fought professionally on ESPN. And it, it floored me. Okay, imagine flying all the way up to Michigan and didn't even get to fight, didn't even get to try. And, you know, and I thought, I thought to myself, you know, as, as you asked the question just now, I've had so many of those incidents. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to do the Guinness World Record at the Chicago Marathon. I flew, I flew to Chicago. I'm going to do this Guinness World Record in a booth at the Chicago Marathon. And we found out we didn't have enough medical witnesses. We had to have a medical witness there 24-7. So I had to fly back. I didn't get to do it. Well, in both of those cases, Rather than cry, mm-hmm. on my way back to Texas to the Guinness World Record, as I was flying back, I thought, I'll just do the Guinness World Record. I'll do it at my college, and I'll have medical witnesses there because we have a nursing program. And bingo. So that was that. Mm-hmm. And with the, uh, when I flew to Michigan, uh, I, w- I was despondent. I mean, imagine, you know, I flew to Michigan for nothing. Mm-hmm. And then, what, what, what did happen, and it took a little bit of time, uh, I had to get a lawyer, and, and this is where, you know, some people are, are reticent for about, you know, oh, I don't want to upset the apple cart, but Taekwondo was such a big part of my life. So I got a lawyer, and he called the president of the AAU, and I was on a conference call, and he told the president, he said, hey, this kid, you're taking away years of his life. You know, we're going to sue you, something like that. I don't remember mm-hmm. the exact word. I was back in, like, the next day. Wow. So, in answer to your question, we have to be proactive. We have to just search for other avenues, and, and there's always another avenue. I would add to that and say every setback is an opportunity. Absolutely. Beautifully said. Yeah. Thank you. And I really, truly think that way. And when I was always in a rush and I was younger, and I mean, you know, for my generation, unfortunately for people much younger, like, teenagers and 20s, they expect everything to happen simultaneously. So people say that technology could be your biggest asset and yet your biggest liability is a result of that. You know, I'm not saying, you know, I'm at some point, I don't know, six months from now, I might have to remind you, Tom, you don't want to keep checking all the fans you have on Facebook or see who's following you on Twitter because a lot of people are doing that and using that as a metrics to measure their own success. So... 
or by paycheck or who knows. But I think I'm very excited for you. I think based on the new policy, I think this setback as seen on the surface is a great opportunity for you to grow something on your own, just like my podcast, you know, is, um, is an opportunity I created for myself. But I promise you, I have one last question for you and we'll wrap up the whole thing and you can go grab your snack. I'll go eat some yogurt. But the final question (laughs) I have is you are very optimistic. You're a very curious person and curiosity is a theme on my podcast. Are there any exercises, routines or, you know, sports, meditation or anything that you hope to get into that intrigues you? Well, you want to learn more of before getting into okay. it. You, you know, uh, as you look at workout routines, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, you know, you see kettlebells now, you see P90X, you see mm-hmm. Insanity, but these, these are just <laughs> old programs who are refashioned. And this, this happens, this is, in the fitness industry, it's all cyclical. And everybody's trying to make money, so, you know, they call something new, but it's really not. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm actually fine with all this, and uh, everything from TRX to, uh, you know, all, some of the different types of competitions that come out to get people working out, you know, is fine. But my only, my only fear about some of them is that sometimes these, quote, fads can cause injury, and, and there's some issues there. But uh, some, something, when you talk about meditation and when I was in 10th uh, grade, I was kind of hyperactive, kind of a type A kid. Mm-hmm. And, and so I needed something, and I knew it. So I convinced my parents to let me take a transcendental meditation class. And I had to drive to Lehigh University, and I took this class. At the time, it was, it was only $35. I know now, I think that cost about four to $500 or whatever. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I took the class. I remember the instructor said, if you meditate 20 minutes a day in the morning and then in the evening, you'll reach enlightenment in five years. So, you know, that intrigued me. And I, I raised my hand. And remember, I'm, I'm a young kid. I'm a sophomore in high school. Mm-hmm. And all these other people were older folks, you know, like your age, you know, in your 30s. And, mm-hmm. and so I said, I said, sir, have you reached enlightenment? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I asked it innocently. I, I was just... Naive, I didn't know what enlightenment really was. And he, he scolded me and <laughs> for asking the question. Mm-hmm. And I kind of looked around and people were kind of rolling their eyes like, yeah, he hasn't reached enlightenment. <laughs> and, and then, you know, over, over the years, I've been fortunate. Like, uh, I actually came to Boston. There's a publishing company called YMAA up there. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, it's a... So kind of a martial arts publisher, but it's mostly soft style stuff, like Kung Fu and, and all that. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the president or CEO of that company, his name is Nestor. I think it's Y-A-N-G. It's been years since I've been there. Mm-hmm. But um, he, 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 he's a prolific meditator. He meditates four hours a day. But he also has written 30 books, and he has a Ph.D., and so he... You know, he's done a lot in his life. You think, wow, someone that meditates four hours a day probably doesn't do anything else. But after after speaking with him, and, and I came back down to Texas, um, I, I kind of didn't finish the story. So I, I meditated for five years. After um, when I was a sophomore in high school, I meditated all the way through my years at Penn State. Yes. And then I realized it had been more than five years that I hadn't reached enlightenment. And I, you know, I know that sounds silly. I really kind of believed the guy, you know, that mm-hmm. if I would have been, you know, and I was consistent. I never missed a day. I was morning and you know, afternoon. And so I kind of turned my attention to instead of meditation, prayer. Mm-hmm. And if you do the research on the physiological aspects of meditation and prayer, they're very similar. Mm-hmm. You know, you get the quieting of the metabolism of your Galvanic skin response increases, your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes down, you know, all these really cool things. And so I found that prayer became my substitute for meditation. And I, I don't, 
advocate one or the other, but I advocate doing something, mm -hmm. something to quiet yourself down. I, I think, I'm not saying that people who are, are very active like you and, and people, you know, I'm, I'm pretty active. Mm -hmm. We need something to quiet down. Oh, yeah. And, I completely and agree. <laughs> when, I was, when I was doing the ultra cycling, the, the long, long distance cycling where, you know, I was literally riding my bike at least six hours a day. And that doesn't include the other activities like the weight training, the karate, and the tennis. But, but the cycling itself became my meditative experience because pedaling little circles for hours on end mm -hmm. is truly meditation. So in answer to your question, I miss that. You know, I, I'm no longer cycling for those long, long periods of time. But I still pray mm -hmm. and... I'm still riding a little bit, but I think everybody, because of our crazy world of, of all of our phones and mm -hmm. we don't ever turn off, that we need something. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm constantly looking for ways to kind of cultivate that mind-body experience. And it, it's so easy to, to get caught up. I mean, look at our interview. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, my gosh. Now, now you won't have time to meditate because you just went way over time on this interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll still find time. <laughs> I must echo a lot of what you said. People like us are very active and, you know, people like us are obligated uh, to a certain degree to share experience, to benefit others. And honestly, for the longest time, my own guilt is that I had not taken care of myself. Started when I was in college, I ate poorly, I was always at work, always working, um, two, three jobs, and and I thought I was young. I didn't have to take care of myself and develop like a temporary ulcer. It was really uncomfortable. And not until like a few years into my career, after I started making money, to say that, okay, let me do this. So more recently, um, this I keep referring to James Altucher, who's a very successful business person and podcaster, the term that he used is be gentle on yourself. And I love that. And, you know, my guilty pleasure are, I love this meditation expert. Her name is Tara Brock, B-R-A-C-H. I will send some of the information your way that I almost have to use the word addictive. <laughs> you avoided that, but I'm bringing it back because she is phenomenal and she's inspired people all around the world. She has a podcast. So if you have an Android phone or iPod, very easily accessible or even just simply through a website. Uh, and I listen to her every night before I go to sleep and I should do better and listen to that in the morning in a sitting or, or, or you know, a comfortable position, I guess. But it's just so soothing and she has so much information and she's not like someone who's pretending or recycling information to impress the world. She has so much to say, highly recommend it. And personally for me, to your point, Donna, I found the venues for myself. I meditate, uh, unfortunately not on a regular basis, but always enjoyed it. And I love doing yoga and I love swimming and to put my head on the water and like tune, tune out the world and just be on my own. And one of the terms I love very much right now is the word pause um, was from um, a Tara Brock like just think about pausing like we just pause in the middle of the day whatever a minute or two I think that's really powerful so yeah I'm so glad I'm yeah. so happy and peaceful right now <laughs> yeah I mean, that, 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 that is a great way to end it and, and, and I have a sentence in, in a book I wrote I, I wrote a book years ago and I was really into the meditation, and I, I wrote a sentence in there that those who don't feel they have the time to do the meditation, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, those are the people that need it the most. Because just like you said, because we don't pause. Mm -hmm. we, we just go from one thing to the next. And you said something very important. So many of us are afraid to be alone. Mm -hmm. We're afraid to be alone with our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And it's scary. And, and with most people, just check them out. They're always on their phone. They're listening. They're watching TV. They're, they're never alone with their thoughts. And mm -hmm. in our social, look at, look at how our, the 
society has changed. Nobody talks anymore. Everybody's, you know, we're mm-hmm. talking now. But mm-hmm. most people are, are texting. They're, they're on their phones, but they're not talking. They're not talking socially one-on-one anymore. At least that's what I'm seeing down at, at the college where I teach. Mm-hmm. They walk into my fitness center, and they immediately put their headphones on, and there's no conversation. And it's sad to me. You, you made a comment earlier mm-hmm. where technology can be a best friend or it can destroy us, something like that. Mm-hmm. And absolutely, I, I think that's one area where we're losing our social, you know, our socialization. We're, we're depending on texting and, and not really conversing with people. But, but I'm glad we got to converse. And uh, I yeah. made a new friend tonight, and I'm so glad that you know, you have a real energy about you that that uh, makes me smile, and, and I really appreciate you allowing me to do this. And uh, it was fun. Thank you, thank you, Tom. I hope to see that uh, see a sequel of this. Whatever form, whatever the format you're comfortable with, I hope to be part of the journey with you. And and also, if there's anything I can help Linda with to help her to the next level, maybe we'll start with you first. And she seems to be very powerful and she already has a vision on her own. And I must say that when you mentioned that the people that I've influenced, one of my guests, I'm so, so proud of this. I'm saving all her emails as evidence that one of the guests from earlier, um, she sent me this amazing email about a week ago saying her her dad is, um, you know, she has an aging father and and she decided that you know, before it's too late, she would like to sit down with her dad and, and record some of these amazing things that, you know, he has said to her. And she wants to record some of the conversations. She was asking me for help to find the right microphone and all that jazz. And as of last night, she emailed me and she said she's very determined to create her own podcast. So I am so thrilled. And this is the effect that I didn't quite see coming, but I love the fact that we're all connecting, and this is an experience. These two hours are an experience between the two of us. We created this moment, and we'll be forever holding on to. So it is so meaningful all around, and thank you so much for being part of this. And you'll hear well, from me very soon. Well, thank you. You have you have a way with words, and that's why you're a podcaster. I love it. it so that concludes part one of my conversation with Tom Seaborn, and in part two. We'll be focusing on personal life, goals, and and even challenges as a fitness educator today. I offer Tom some of my own advice on uh, how an athlete like himself could potentially take advantage of social media, but beyond Facebook and Twitter, um, for example, places or channels such as Quora or Ubersense, and how to influence people at a national and international level without extensive travel. And that was an important factor for Tom. But you know what? There is no better era than the one we're in today to influence, educate, and establish authentic connections right from our homes. To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F-E-I-S-W-O-R-L-D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at FaceWorld. Until next time, thanks for listening.